I want to do a countdown. All right. Well, good evening. We are uh, glad that you're all here and able to be part of our Sunday evening Bible study here at Ephesus. We are uh, encouraged by your presence here and we want to thank those of you who are tuning in uh, to thank you for doing that as well. It's always good to hear words of encouragement and uh, uh, an attaboy, if you will. And uh, good job with y'all singing. I can't believe y'all. that's really y'all. That's what I hear from time to time. And we thank you for those words of encouragement as well. Before we begin this evening, we'd like to go to God in a word of prayer. If you would, please bow with me. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this first day of the week and the many blessings you have given us. Lord, we pray that you will be with us during our class time and that you will guide us and direct us. Father, help us to open our hearts and our minds to your word, that it may move and to change us, to have us to become what you would have us to be as your disciples and as your little children, that we could represent you as a light in a dark world. Father, we pray that you will forgive us from our sins as we repent of them. And Father, we pray that you will encourage us and strengthen us to take a hold of that way of escape when we are tempted. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so we're going to begin tonight with a little bit of trivia. This is mainly uh, directed toward uh, those of you who are, let's say, under the age of 18. Okay, just because we're going to put some limits on it. Here we go. How many books are in the Bible? How many? 66, that's right. Uh, how many are in the Old Testament? How many books are in the Old Testament? How many? There are two, but there's also a whole lot more. So how many in all? Uh, uh, how many books in all in the Old Testament? Let's go with 39. Let's say 39. All right, so if we've got 66 in all, and there's 39 in the Old Testament... How many does that leave for the New Testament? 27. There we go. That's what I'm talking about. And what is the first book of the Bible? And what does it cover? What's the first book of the Bible? Genesis. Okay. What does that cover? What is the book of Genesis? There's 50 chapters, so it's a pretty long book. It covers uh, more than just 50 chapters of life. It covers actually a few thousand years. What all does the... Book of Genesis cover if we're doing our 17 periods, maybe. We have. What's the first period? Are you going over 18 yet? <laughs> we're going over 18 yet? All right. Does anybody want to answer? Under 18? Okay. We have. Uh, we're going to go with before, before the flood. Everybody. The, the flood. Scattering of the people. Patriarchs, right? So that, that's, that's where we're going to get us. That's, that'll be the first book of the Bible. That's what all it covers. All right, let's go back. Let's see. Who were the parents of Jesus on earth? Who were the earthly parents of Jesus? Joseph and Mary. There we go. Let's sing Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Last line it says, the what tells me so? What? The Bible. Okay. The B I B L E. The B I B L E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God. The B I B L E. And in the Bible, we said there was 27 books in the New Testament earlier. So what is the first book of the New Testament? Matthew. That's very right. What's the last book? Revelation. And let's sing all of the ones in between. All right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Acts and left to the Romans. First 
first and second Corinthians, Galatians and Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, first and second Thessalonians, first and second Timothy, Titus and Philemon, Hebrews, James, first and second Peter, first and second and third John. And then while we read the Bible, we find out about who all Jesus, lo Jesus loves. We said that Jesus loves me, this I know, but he also loves who? Everybody. And we're, let's see, Jesus loves the little children. Jesus loves the little children, all the children. Okay, so we mentioned a while ago when we said, what does the book of Genesis cover? We did before the flood to the patriarchs. Let's sing all of our 17 periods of Bible history. Okay. Before the flood, the flood, the scattering of the people, the patriarchs, the exodus, the wandering in the wilderness, invasion and conquest, judges united kingdom, Divided kingdom, Judah alone, captivity and return. The years of silence, life of Christ. The early church, the letters to Christians. These are the 17 periods of Bible history. All right. So we're going to begin looking at something uh, different tonight. We've been through the 17 periods and... Last week we had a whole Bible review of those periods and things that they covered. Well, tonight we're going to find a little section within those 17 periods and we're going to be begin discussing and dissecting. Yeah, uh, we're going to look at the Ten Commandments and the 21st century Christian. There's a lot that is discussed about the Ten Commandments. There is uh, court trials, and there is political uprising, and there is trying to establish it within certain state houses and government buildings, and, and, and installing the Ten Commandments. Well, what is the? What are the Ten Commandments? What are they? Does any, can anybody tell me real quickly what are the Ten Commandments? Okay, so we have the Ten commands that is part of the covenant between God and his children. Uh, if we look at it, it's going to come for us, if we're going to put it in our filing cabinet of periods, it's going to come during the exodus from Egypt. But what we're trying to figure out is how does that apply to me? It's, it's about the covenant between God and the children of Israel as they're fleeing from Egypt. But what does that matter to me? That, that was several millenniums ago. We, what does that matter? How does that affect me? And what should it mean for me? And what value do the, ten to the to, do the Ten Commandments have for me? What do they have? I mean, that, that's, that's so long ago. It's found in Je Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. It's where they are all listed out for us. And God gave this to Moses on, on Mount Sinai. And the children of Israel began to, to cry out in fear when this is handed down. And, and they said, with all the lightning and the thunder and the rumbling and the smoke coming up from the mountain. And they said, keep God up there. We don't want anything to do with him. And they began to fear God in, in a righteous way. And they were scared. They said, we do not want that wrath down upon us. Let's read Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. Okay. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, you should not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, 
visiting the iniquity of the fathers of the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the Lord, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold them, he'll hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. And this concludes the giving of the Ten Commandments. As time goes by... Uh, in the coming weeks, we're going to get into more detail and look and itemize and see individually applications to us today. But this evening, we're just trying to get the big picture of the Ten Commandments and its application to me 3,500, 4,000 years later. Uh, so if we were going to break down the Ten Commandments, we could say that the first four uh, kind of deal with a man and his relationship to God. You shall not take the Lord's name in vain. You shall honor the Sabbath day and keep it as the Lord's day. You shall not make any carved image. You don't worship any other God. These things deal with God and me. Me and God in our relationship and how I am to honor God as the Lord God and how I am to keep His name reverend, how I'm supposed to respect Him and, and give Him tribute. That's what we're dealing with. And then if we think about the last six, uh, and we think about, if you number them, five through ten, we're talking about me and my relationship to my neighbor. It is man dealing with man. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. You, you shall not lie. These type of things, this is the interaction between me and you. This is me and someone else. So man and his relationship to his neighbor and how that fellowship is to occur. That's kind of how things are broken up. If we are going to summarize, what did Jesus say were the two greatest commands? They were to do what? What was the first and greatest command? Love the Lord your God. Everything that is in you, love God. So if we were going to say the first four are going to be given what command? Love the Lord your God. What was command number two of the greatest commands that Jesus gave? Love your neighbor as yourself. So if we're going to group together 5 through 10, we can put all of them underneath the category of what Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Because if you're going to not kill them and you're not going to steal from them and you're not going to lie about them, that would be loving them, right? And, and it actually goes even more than that. So I'm going to try not to sidetrack too much. But that's the general idea there. We can put them in these two categories. But the question still remains, what value do these commands have for me today? How can I put these Ten Commandments into practice today? Uh, Romans chapter 3 and verse 19 and verse 20, it says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So, as Brother Gerald spoke for us a while ago, he said these were commands from God to the people and it's part of a covenant. And we call this the law. And, and of course the law was much, much greater than just ten rules. It was books and books from uh, 
Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers. We have all of these kind of, this makes up the books of the law. They're called the Torah. This is, encapsulates everything that God had for them to do and how they could live and feasts to keep and offerings to give up and, and so forth and so on. It's much, much more than just these Ten Commandments. But when we think about the law, very applicably, we think about the Ten Commandments. It says in verse 19, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. Are we under the law today? No. Uh, we spoke about that this morning from Galatians in chapter 3. It said, we, we're not under that law anymore. We, we, are, we are relieved from that law because the one who has bore the law for us was Christ and he was put on the tree. So we do not have to bear the burden of the law anymore. It is overbearing. It is hard. It is cumbersome. It is a tutor as we would refer to it as. But we are no longer under the bondage of the law. But what do we get from the law? What's the last line there? The law becomes the knowledge of sin, right? So we, we, how do we learn what sin is? From the law. How do we know right from wrong growing up? Because your mama and daddy taught you the law, right? They, they trained you up and they said, this is something we do, this is something we don't do. You don't talk back to me or you end up with your head over there in the hallway and you'll have to get you some screws to reattach it and you don't, you don't disrespect your mama and you don't lie to your teacher and you don't take things that don't belong to you and you play nice with us. You, we learned all of those laws, right? We learned all of those rules and we learned how to follow them. And that's how we learned what right and wrong was. When it comes to sin... We're really finding out what is right and we're finding out that thing that is wrong which we have called sin. That is missing the mark and not doing what God would have us to do. So we would call that sin. That is how we learn. We learn from the law. So what do the Ten Commandments offer us today? Well, we learn what sin is by the commandments. And we get to learn and grow and we become accountable to God based upon these things. And so first and foremost, the commandments are God's instrument that reveal sin and its consequences. So for those who are not Christians, for those who are not Christians, this is important because it is through the commands and the law that we become aware of sin and its consequences that one begins to seek forgiveness, not before. So what does that say? Well, we're saying this. Without the law, is there any need for justification of sin. No. Because we don't know, what, there is no wrong. If there is no law, there is no wrong. And we live in this utopia that many people even perceive that we live in today, that there is no sin. And that there is no wrong. So without the law, we cannot be aware of our sin. We cannot be aware of right and wrong. And there is no need to preach repentance and forgiveness and what Christ has done if there is no right and there is no wrong. But it is not until the point that someone realizes what sin is and that they have sin in their life that they seek out forgiveness. Because there is no guilt of the conscience. There is no sorrowful feeling. There is no need for reconciliation because there is no sin. So by the law, we understand what sin is and we can begin to understand the great thing that Christ did for us and how he loved us because we are now aware of our sin because of the law. The world would say that there is no such thing as sin. You do what feels good. You, you, you make your own right and wrong. It, it is a matter of feeling. It is a matter of, of emotion as to what is right and what is wrong. We can get the two mixed up. What is... There can be no definite right and wrong without the law. We would simply be going upon feelings, cultural norms. Uh, we would be going upon times and changes and so forth and so on. Uh, I find it interesting to, to go back and read old laws. Like, I'm, not, I'm talking about 
old written you know, laws of the land. Uh, there was a guy that went through and uh, he said, I'm going to break eight laws today. And this was in England. And he, he had gone back through history and he found eight old laws that were just, you know, what we consider now just silly laws. And he was going to go and break them. So what he did was, one of them was, uh, he said, it, it's illegal to gamble in a library. So he went to a library and he just went down the hallways until he found some, would you please just bet me a penny in a game of 21 so we can break this law. And finally, after about the fourth person, they said, sure. And then, so he, he broke that one and then the, he couldn't clean his shoes in some fountain. And so he went to that fountain and he cleaned his shoes in that fountain. Well, there was two laws that he broke simultaneously. I thought this was real bold. He broke the law uh, from the 13th century that said you cannot go into public outside the queen's palace without shoes on. So he did that barefooted and you also could not clean your rug on a Saturday in public. So he had taken a dirty, dusty rug. He went barefooted outside the queen's palace and he began to air out his, air out his rug. He, his goal was just to break as many laws as possible. Well, we look at that now and we think, well, that's just silly. You know, that's just, that's just crazy. You know, why would that matter? Well, at the time, that was right and wrong. And that was a law that was set forth. If there is no law given by God, we simply just make it up as we go. And we do what feels good and we do what the culture says is okay and acceptable. And if we look back and go, oh, that's silly. God's not going to count that against you anymore. We'll just overlook that. We'll override that. Or, you know, we have more choices and we have more rights now. But that is not the way that it is. The law is set forth and given unto us by God as the defining line. And there is no gray area. There is only... As, you would, as we say, black and white. There is very clear, defined what is right and what is wrong. For the Christian, the, the commandments give us this. They're important because even though his sins are forgiven at baptism, he needs to know about sin and how to deal with it on a daily basis in order to grow in Christ. So for us as Christians, we begin to understand, we understand that there is sin and, and we sought out forgiveness through Jesus in that. We then are forgiven at the point of baptism and we are, are washed and we have the remission of sins and we are baptized in a part of the body of Christ. But we need to know about sin and how can we grow and how can we attack the daily challenges that go along with sin. It is a growth process that we refer to as sanctification. So there is, a, there is this salvation versus sanctification. And that is not to say that one is right and good and the other is bad and evil. But salvation and sanctification, I think we oftentimes uh, mix the two up. And while they do intermingle and there are overlapping areas, if we, thought, if we kind of break it in our mind like this. Salvation is a one-time event once for all time. And so... We, we oftentimes apply the verse, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So at this moment, you are now saved is what we would say. We would say that you are now just in the eyes of God. No person is ever more righteous than they are at the moment that they are born and at the moment that they are born again. You are clean, you are cleansed, you are white as snow. Sanctification is the way God, and He does this through the Word and through the Spirit, he matures us in Christ. So when we are saved, we then begin this idea that we are going to repent. We're not going to do the old things anymore that we once did, that we were brought into that that is wrong by the law. Remember the law taught us that that was wrong, so now I'm going to repent of it. I have been baptized. I have been saved, if you will. And we are now going to grow. Does that mean that suddenly... Just like that, we are completely changed. I'm never going to sin again. I'm never going to be tempted again. And I'm totally justified before God. No. That is our goal. That is our aim. That is, our, that is the way we are guided. But it is a growth process. And it is a challenging process. And, and it, is, it is this right here. It is that, you know, yes, I'm, if I'm an alcoholic and, and I said, you know, I need to become a Christian, I understand that. I'm a drunkard and this is not right. And so they go in that night and then they begin and they just say, I'm going to throw everything out of the fridge. I'm going to throw everything out. And, and, and then we, we say, 
Well, three weeks later, they end up at a restaurant with somebody and they drink. It's this, it's this right here. It's this growth process of how do I need to attack this? God, can you give me the strength to grow and to be strong and to endure and to build up? Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16, talking about how can we apply this? Well, it says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry for building up the body of Christ. Well, who, what is the body of Christ? Well, that is the church. That is the Christians. That is us as individuals. We're going to be built up until we attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning and by craftiness and in deceitful schemes. Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is head into Christ, from, the, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. What is the continuing theme, if you will, through this passage? What It's about this building up and growing, right? We talked about that you might grow from, from little children to mature, to mature manhood, that you might grow within the body of Christ and that you might be held together as the whole body and that we might Grow and know who is head, that is Christ, that we are to grow up in every way into Him. So it's this idea that we are constantly growing and we're developing to become that sanctified, pure image of Christ. That we as disciples are, are following after Him and following after that pattern. That we're trying to grow. And that is not to say that, well, you're going to earn it. You know, you're, gonna, you're trying to go out and you're trying to earn your salvation. That is not it. This is the growth that occurs by the Holy Spirit inside of me. This is not some kind of thing like, well, I've got to go earn it today. I've got to go out and I've got to make it. This is God who is changing us and growing us. And it is us saying, yes, Father, I will do what you would have me to do. I will change to the way that you want me to be. And that I hope you will strengthen me and encourage me and lift me up that I might grow mature the way that you want me to be. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 29, So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that, at it, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. It is not something that I get to go around and say, look at what I, look at me, look what I did. Look what I did. You know, it's not like after a big play in football that we get to boast out our hands and our chest and our hands and our head and we get to say, look what I have accomplished. But much more, it is look what the Lord has now done in me. And he can do the same thing in you. And we boast in the things that what God has done. So the Ten Commandments and you. What can we do about this? Well, thing number one, let, let us not be afraid or upset. As we begin to look at this, uh, nobody likes their faults or their shortcomings pointed out. Uh, but remember, God is talking to you and it is He that has the right to do so because He doesn't have any faults. Try to see this as an opportunity to eliminate something that is stopping your progress in Christ. We don't need to, as we begin to explore this and we begin to talk about this, and I'm hoping that we can do this in a, in a way that we can get some more feedback. We're going to try to get some feedback from you in just a moment. Uh, that, that we can be open and we can be honest because it's God pointing out our faults. And it is, he's doing this so that we could grow, so that we can become sanctified, so that we can uh, be better today than we were yesterday as we begin to find out the things that he has for us to do and things for us not to do. Number two, let us be honest with God. Uh, 
so many times we, we think that, well, if we don't talk about the sin and we don't look at the sin and if we don't tell nobody about the sin, it really ain't a sin. When Joseph was being uh, tempted by Potiphar's wife, he said, how can I commit this great sin against you and against God? And, and so... When we sin, we're not just, even if we do, uh, we break one of the commandments, number 5 through 10, you know, where we're really dealing with uh, our neighbor or a person, a man-to-man -man kind of thing, we, we still, that is a command that is given by God. So not only have I done you wrong, but I also have broken the command of God. We need to be honest with God and be willing to admit our sin to Him. Pray to Him and to talk to Him about our shortcomings and about how we need help. He knows when we need help. We, he knows when we need to be lifted up and we need to be uh, encouraged. You cannot grow if you do not abandon sin and you cannot abandon sin if you do not acknowledge its existence in the first place. If you are honest with God, He will forgive you. He will also give you the strength to deal with your sin in the new day. Number three, we need to be patient. And we need to be patient with one another. We need to be patient with God. And we need to be patient in our own lives. Sometimes it takes a long, long time to overcome certain temptations. It takes a long, long time to go through that. And the longer that you have allowed a sin to fester in your life and to be part of your life and to help make and mold you into the person that you have become, it's going to be harder to get rid of that. And it's going to be harder to put that off. We need to be patient, consistent, and persistent in all of the things that we do. Many times we look for one grand thing in one moment and it just changes it all. Uh, we, we can't, we, if we think about this in a physical activity sort of way, we couldn't go to the gym on the first day of the month. You know, we're going, all right, I'm going to go to the gym Wednesday and I'm going to do, and I'm going to work out for six hours, hard, intense workout, six hours. You know, I'm going to give it everything that I've got. I'm going to leave everything out there on the floor. You know, I'm, I'm going to do, I'm going to do everything I can do to leave it all out there and just barely make it back to the vehicle and say, you know, because I'm going to start working out today. And then you do that on October 1st, and then for the next 30 days you don't, you don't do anything. And you just your diet consists of Twix, Hershey bars, and Snickers because that's the greatest three items there ever was. And then you say, well, I worked out that one day. But, what it, but if we do this right here, if we just do small, consistent, persistent changes where it's like, hey, just 20 minutes a day, you know, I'm, I'm going to just walk 20 minutes a day. And we can see how every day that's going to set up that mentality of being persistent and doing this over time. And it, it's because that one day, that one massive day isn't really going to accomplish very much. But small in, incremental changes continuing daily, those are the keys. So when we see that physically and we understand that, the same thing can be said. Every day we set aside time and we say we're going to put God first at the first part of the day. And I hope to grow because of that, Jesus freely gives us salvation and promises to be with us each day as we grow up into Him. So, here's some questions for you. Uh, let, let's start you out real calm, okay? Well, I don't want any great grand moves right here. Okay, just by a show of hands. Uh, did you learn about the Ten Commandments as a child? Raise your hand. Did you learn about those as a child growing up? It's most to everybody. What about as an adult? Did you raise your hand? We have three, four, five, six. We learned about them as an adult too. So yeah, we, we learn about the Ten Commandments at, at different times and continually over time. Did you ever take them personally? Like did one of them just like really, like that commandment was written at me. Have you, have you ever done that? Raise your hand. Yeah, I feel like. Nine out of ten were written right at me. You know, that's, that's kind of the way I feel. Uh, uh, I, I thought about a story. I'm, I'm not going to tell that. All right, so number three. Uh, has, has any one of the Ten Commandments seemed particularly important or, meaningf or 
meaningful to you over the others. One of them more so than another. What, which one? Let's, let's, start, let's start. Here we go. Number one. Number one. Which is... Number one. There's only one. One God. Okay. Anybody else got anything else? Another one hits you a little bit. What's that? Honor your father and mother. Yeah. What's that? Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Well, that's a that's a common one for society, and that impacts us when you hear it every single day. We begin to put in euphemisms like, "Well, I didn't say God," you know, "I I made," but that's what you meant. Uh, so yeah, we have we all have one that was maybe a little bit more direct toward me than others. Was there any sin you were especially relieved to be forgiven at baptism? At do you want to share it? That could be. That, say this is this is one of those big bowls. Everybody, nope, nope. I just had forty three people break eye contact. All right. So and there's three people at the house that turned off the TV. So we did really good right there. Uh, they 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 said I don't want him looking at him. I thought he was talking to me there for a minute. Well, what if we think about that and we think about how relieved we were in that moment that that's gone? And you know that's man, that's not on me no more. And that feeling, that liberating feeling. And, and you know, if, even if we don't want to maybe tell everybody about that particular moment, we do want to tell everybody about that feeling, about what it was like to be relieved and forgiven. And what do you feel is the biggest obstacle stopping Christians from growing in Christ? I'll tell you mine, I think it's TikTok. And I laugh about it. But I'm 100% certain of it. If you don't know what TikTok is, don't look it up. Just count your blessings. I, I'm a firm believer that that's, that's one of the biggest ones today. What about y'all? Y'all got something? Society in, society in general. The downward spiral of society. Uh, fearing not God nor man. They don't care about anything or anybody, it seems like. It's just like, well, just, I, it's, all about, it's all about me and what I want. Ourselves, yeah. Ourselves is one of the biggest obstacles. Uh, our energy, like, just everything, like, you know, like, the sin, like, all kinds of, like, all the sin and all that. All of the sin. All of the sin that is open and available to us and how we have ample opportunities to go after it. Number six, how do you react when God points out one of your sins? Okay, what about that? Do we, do we go, thank you, God, for pointing that out to me? Or do we go, shut up, shut up, I don't want to hear it. I don't want, I don't want that in my life. I don't want that in my face. Or do we hide from it? Or do we run away from it? Or do, what do we do? How do we react? It depends on which sin it is, yeah. Some sins we're like, oh, yeah, we need to be, oh, we'll bring that out in public. And then we'll have others just like, I don't want nobody to know about that, you know. That's, that's, for, that's for me and my casket. That's the only two people that's supposed to know about that one. I don't need nobody to know about that. So yeah, it does. It, it kind of matters how what the sin is. I, I, I believe that, and that's be true. All right, lastly, would you be willing to memorize the Ten Commandments? How many of you have them memorized right now? Well, I can tell you, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I can name them, uh, but they, they wouldn't be in order. You know, so we're going we're gonna to work on that throughout this thing. What, what's number one? Let's just start real simple. What's number one? What's that? Come on. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. What are we going to do this week that's going to put God in second place? We're going to sing in just a moment, number 739, as a song of invitation. Now, I want you to think about other gods that you put before God. And, and, and are they still there? What have we idolized before God? And that's, that's what we'll get into next week, is other gods and other idols that we have put up and how we need to tear those down. But in this moment... 
I want us to think about what our God has done for us and giving us His Son so that we can be forgiven from all of the realization of sin that we now have. And I want you to think about what that thing you've put in place of God has done and how it is so minor in comparison. Oh, it might have done something for you. It might have made you feel good. It might have, you know, gave you encouragement. It might have taken your mind away. It might have done something but what is that in comparison to what God has done for us in the giving of His Son to redeem us? We have been bought with a price and the blood of Jesus Christ was the payment for my sin. And if you're here this evening and you are subject to the Lord's invitation to become His child and to become a Christian, to be washed in that blood and become white as snow. If you need the prayers of the church, if you need help and encouragement as we grow and to be sanctified, we, we want you to come as we stand and as we sing. What will you do with Jesus? What question comes to you? Once again, I want to thank you for being here tonight and your participation with our class period. Uh, we will meet again Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. I want to invite you to come back if you are able to do so physically and are with us as we have another Bible study period. And also, again, it will be available online. We will uh, come back next Lord's Day beginning at 10 o'clock. In just a moment, I want to ask Brother Gerald Kirby, if he would, to dismiss us with prayer. Uh, are there any other announcements that have been made at this time? If you are unable to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, uh, then we want to uh, invite you to the office area as you leave on your left where the emblems are prepared and we'll be glad to assist you. Nothing else, Brother Gerald. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for 
all the many blessings that you give us from day to day. We are thankful for the life that you have given each one of us. We're thankful for the blessings that are contained therein. Father, we're so thankful for the hour that we have been able to spend together in studying your word and listening to it being taught to us. We're thankful that we have the avenue of prayer with you that when something is on our minds that we can come to you in prayer and have it answered. Father, at this time we are mindful of those of our number that are sick and are not able to be with us. We're also mindful of those that have lost loved ones and Father, we pray your blessings upon those families as they deal with the loss of their loved one. Father, as we are about to be separated, we ask you to go with each one of us, to guard, guide, and direct us, and to bring us back at our next appointed time. Forgive us for our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.